In this part of the chapter, you'll learn how to convert sentences into numbers that can be used with the model you just loaded. Now, the exact process differs from model to model, but for the model you are using here, you need to head back to the vocab file you saw earlier to understand how to encode words to numbers that the model can understand. If you open the vocab file in the text editor, you'll see something like what's shown on this slide. Essentially, this is a lookup table on how to convert meaningful words the model learned about to numbers that it can actually understand. There's also some special cases at the top of the file, pad, start, and unknown. So let's dive into those first. So first up, you have the pad token that's represented by the number zero. It turns out that machine learning models like to have a fixed number of inputs, no matter how long your sentence might be. The model used in this demo expects that there's always 20 numbers for the input that represent the words in the sentence that was defined by the creator of the model and can be changed if you retrain the model later. So if you have a phrase like, I like video content, you would fill the remaining word spaces in the array with zeros that represent the pad token. If a sentence is greater than the space available, you need to split it up so it fits this requirement and instead do multiple classifications on many smaller sentences. Next, you have the start token represented by the number one. This is always the first token in the array. You'll notice in the example input shown that the array numbers start with a one, which just defines the start of the sentence. The third special token to know about is the unknown token represented by the number two. In this example encoding, you can see that there's one unknown token, meaning that the word did not exist in the vocab file to be given some other number. Again, going back to our trivial example of a sentence that was, I like video content, maybe the word content did not exist in the vocab file, so a two is used to represent it here instead. So bringing it all together, the final piece of the puzzle is to encode the words it does know about. Here you can see you have the numbers three, nine, and five after the start token, which if you look those up in the vocab file, they represent the words I like video respectively. And that's essentially how you can encode a sentence in a form the model can understand and use. In this case, due to the start token taking up one position in the 20 number input, any given sentence can have up to 19 words before you need to start splitting it up. Now remember here, if your input is over 19 words, you'll need to break it down into multiple shorter sentences and classify each one, and then maybe classify it overall using some custom metric of how much each was deemed to be spam versus not spam. Now, one question on your mind at this point might be, how are these words in the vocab file chosen and why are they special? Well, for language models, the act of learning what words are similar to each other for a given dimension involves using pre-learned embeddings. Early in this chapter, you saw how each word can be represented on a scale across several dimensions as shown on this slide. An embedding is a vector that is associated with a given word. This can then be used to establish a direction for that word based on criteria that matter to solve a given problem. So, for example, words that are used frequently in comment spam messages will end up having their vectors pointing in a similar direction, and words that don't will point in the opposite direction. The system can then learn what words contribute most to help classify spam versus not spam, and then write those most impactful words to the vocab file like you saw, say maybe the top 1000 or so, which you can then use to encode new sentences for the model to predict. Now it should be noted that the numbers in the vocab file essentially map to known word vectors that are stored in a special embeddings layer in the pre-trained model itself. The model will convert these integer number lookups you have in the vocab file into the vectors you saw on the previous slide that it's learnt. All right, so currently the vocab file is not in a very JS friendly format to digest and use in your web app to help you convert words to numbers. Instead of having the file on the left, it'd be much nicer to have the content stored in a more usable manner as shown on the right, to use as some sort of efficient dictionary when encoding sentences. Well, in the name of time, I've transformed the vocab file into a dictionary.js file, which looks like the one shown on this slide. Essentially, the special encodings for pad, start, and unknown have their own constants to use as needed, and all the other words are stored in a lookup object, whereby the word is the object's property name, and the value of that property is the number encoding that represents the word. Now, if you're curious about the code I wrote to do this automatically, you can check out the link at the bottom to see how I generated this new file from a vocab file as an input. Now, by doing this work in advance and saving the vocab file in a more usable JavaScript format, you don't need to pass and convert to a JavaScript object on every page load, which is more efficient. Even better, 
JavaScript objects have the following properties. An object property name can be any valid JavaScript string or anything that can be converted to a string, including the empty string. However, any property name that's not a valid JavaScript identifier, for example, a property name that has a space or a hyphen or starts with a number, can only be accessed using the square bracket notation. So as long as you use square bracket notation, you can create a rather efficient lookup table through a simple transformation as you know that the words stored are guaranteed to be in a valid form to use in this case. OK, so let's go ahead and import the new dictionary.js file created and use it to tokenize a comment so it can be sent through the model. First, import the dictionary.js file at the URL shown and assign it to a constant called dictionary and then define another constant called encoding underscore length that is set to 20 as this model only supports 20 inputs. Now define a tokenize function that takes an array of strings as inputs. Essentially, these will be the words in a given sentence split by the spaces between them. Next, define a variable called return array that's a 1D array that contains the dictionary.start token in the first position as that must always come first. You can then loop through all the words in the word array and for each word, check dictionary.lookup using the square bracket notation to see if the word exists in the lookup object. If it does, a valid number will be returned and assigned to a variable called encoding. If the word does not exist in the lookup object, then encoding will be undefined. You can then check if the encoding is undefined, and if it is, push the dictionary.unknown token to the array, otherwise you push the valid number that was returned in the encoding variable. Moving on down, the next loop ensures padding is added in case the sentence was less than 19 words. Here you can simply keep adding the padding token while the return array length is less than the desired encoding length. Finally, you can log the return array to inspect the output and then return a tf.tensor2d containing these values. All right, now it's time to go back to your handle comment post function and flesh out the code there. Place the code on the next slides where you see the to-do comment at the end of that function to complete it. First, you can take the current comment text, make it lowercase, and then use a regular expression to remove any non-alphanumeric characters found to ensure no special characters remain in the words. Once the words do not contain any special characters, you can then split the words by spaces that separate them to return an array of words that are stored in a variable named lowercase sentence array. Regular expressions are very powerful to do advanced searches like this. And if you're new to using them, there's plenty of free online resources that you can use to learn more about them if you wish. Next, you can create a list element in memory that you'll add to the document later that will contain a new comment. You can now create some HTML elements to store the comment text in a paragraph element, the username of the person posting, along with the current date in span elements with the appropriate CSS classes set. Moving down here, you can now append the name, date, and paragraph in the in-memory list that you defined above. At this point, the list item has everything it needs to be rendered correctly, so you can add it to the comments list using the prepend method so it appears at the top of that list. You can then clean up the comment text by setting its text to nothing to reset it as the comment was now posted. Next, call your load and predict function and pass to it the tokenized version of the comment, which is stored as an array of words in the lowercase sentence array variable you just defined. You also pass the list item you just created so it gets the correct class for spam or not based on the prediction's outcome. As load and predict is an asynchronous function, you can use the then keyword to wait for the results to come back. Here, an anonymous function is then executed when ready, which is fleshed out below. Let's dive into that. Finally, you can remove the processing class from the post comment button and the comment text element to make them visible again now that processing is complete. OK, so you're almost there. The only thing left to do at this point is to add the final code to your previously defined load and predict function. Head to this function and update it with the code on the following slides. First, start by adding a second parameter called DOM comment. This will be a reference to the comment list item that's about to be rendered to the document so that you can style it appropriately depending if the comment is considered spam or not, according to the outcome of the model.predict in this function. Next, the only thing that has changed in this function is the current to-do comment has been replaced with the highlighted code. Here, you can call the data sync method on the results tensor to access its contents, which is stored in data array. You can then check if the second element that's returned in data array is greater than the spam threshold that you defined at the start of this exercise. Remember, the second element in the output tensor 
represents how likely the comment is to be spam, as you saw in the labels.txt file. If it is, you can add the spam class to the DOM comment to style it appropriately when it's rendered to the document. If you run the code in its current state and type some comments like I've done here, you'll now see that some get marked as spam whilst others make it through without issue. Try some comments of your own and see how it fares. Now, results will not be perfect as you'll discover, and later in this chapter, I'll show you how to retrain the spam model with your own data to improve its ability to classify such comments should it get any wrong. Okay, so now you've got a working spam detection system, the last piece of the interactive app is to use WebSockets via Node.js to relay the non-spam comments to other users who have the page open so only the spam-free comments get sent around. Head on to the next section to learn how to do that. <laughs>